All right, guys, just welcome to the rest station for uh, the next task. Applications of Newton's laws. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's just go over some of the conceptual questions as well as some of the math-based problems. All right, um, you got a car and SUV both traveling at the same speed, so they will lock up their brakes at the same time. So which one do you think will come to stop All right, so you know the answer, but you know how to explain it. All right, so that gets tricky, obviously. So I expect you to be able to answer this question while explaining it and justifying it. So justification is kind of tough because it requires a great deal of understanding of physics. All right, so you just want to make sure that your understanding is there. So you need to be able to do this, obviously conceptually as well as mathematically. So that's one of the things that we will get to review. The next one is about two cars, one with the intellect brake system, the other without. They're moving at the same speed. They will lock up their brakes at the same time. The one without the intellect brake system is going to skip to a stop. And the one with the intellect brake system is going to experience variable friction, interrupted friction. All right, so it'll, it'll roll to a stop in essence. So which one, if any, will come to a stop soon? Right? And once again, you will have to explain why and justify it. On the way. Train versus a car, which one comes to a stop sooner? You kind of know the answer for this one. Most people get it. All right, so car will come to a stop sooner. So the question is... And in case you think a speeding train could simply stop if you were on the tracks in front of it, consider this. A fully loaded brake going 60 miles an hour might take a mile and a half to come to a halt after the brakes are... So a fully loaded freight train, fully loaded freight train is going to take a mile and a half to come to a stop if it's going at 60 miles per hour. Does that make sense? Most of you guys say, yeah, that kind of makes sense, right? Is it really? I right, just want to make sure that your understanding is good because these little things from a policy perspective and people get a college degree, they run for offices and then they're put in a position to make decisions and they just come up with these erroneous decisions. I remember I was reading one article and then um, it was all about airport design, all right? Uh, landing runway design. And for whatever reason, the person in charge decided that the place wasn't good enough because there was no way an airplane which happens to be fairly heavy, was going to be able to come to a stop within the allotted distance. He decided to override the engineers completely because this guy is a politician, got a college degree, more than likely he's got a law, law degree, and he thinks, he thinks that he understands this stuff better than the engineers do. Go figure. I just want to make sure that none of you guys make that mistake. Once you get out of here, you become a politician, guys. Just leave it up to the experts. Your common sense is no substitute, substitute for education. Just remember that. According to Newton's third law, Oh, no, according to Newton's second law, what causes acceleration is the external force. So whenever you walk, drive, run, where does the external force come from? All right, so a lot of you guys, once again, you stay initially mistaken. They thought that, hey, you're generating external force using the muscles. Muscles will only generate internal forces, not external forces. There's no such thing. Internal forces will not cause you to accelerate. Case in point, try to lift yourself up by grabbing your nose. Lift yourself up from the ground by grabbing your nose and pulling it really, really hard. Check to see how well that works. Are you going to be able to generate a lift in doing it that way? The answer to that question is no, because the internal forces will not generate acceleration. So every time we walk, where does the external force come from? External force comes about because of the Newton's third law, right? So you apply a force on the ground in the opposite direction. In turn, the ground in the opposite direction of your motion. In turn, the ground will exert the same force back on the forward direction. And this magic, and that's nothing but magic, happens through friction. So through friction, you apply a force on the ground in the backward direction, and then the ground is going to apply the same force back in the forward direction. All right. So the next question is, what is the nature of friction and why do we care? We do care because if it weren't for friction, none of us would be here today. All right, so without the frictional force, you can't get around. Of how it works, look at this video from ITT. Of how it works, look at this video from ITT Automotive, a company that manufactures ABS systems. First, watch what can happen without ABS. Then, with ABS, the driver stops in time and maintains control of the car. Oh, so the cars with the anti brake systems will come to a stop sooner. Not only will you control the car better, but that car is also going to come to a stop sooner. Why? Short answer is because... Intellect brake systems will generate more friction, so that's the short answer. So the next question is how? Intellect brake systems will give you variable friction, interrupted friction. It's not one single continuous friction. It just pumps the brakes forward. How does that generate more friction? So which means that you will have to provide a tremendous amount of explanation, and every explanation will come with a tremendous amount of justification. All right? Intellect brake systems will generate more friction, so the question is how, given the fact that it's not continuous friction. You know, to answer this particular question, you have to dive into the nature of friction and have a really good understanding of it. 
All right, so what is the nature of friction? What are the contributing factors? Commonsensically, you can come up with three contributing factors. A lot of people will say the size matter. Size matters to surface area contact. It's gonna matter. A lot of people will say that the nature of surface is gonna matter because carpet is gonna give you more traction than ice. And also, you know that the weight matters. Heavy objects will experience more friction. So instead of saying weight, we will take a look at the reaction force to the weight and the force applied against the surface, which is known as the pen point or the normal force. Now, out of these three contributing factors, when you come up with these contributing factors, you gotta test them. All right, um, you have to see which one is a true contributing factor. And upon testing, you realize that one of them does not contribute to friction. Nature of surface is gonna matter because you know carpet is gonna generate more traction than ice. And then the conditions of the surface is also gonna matter. Different materials will offer different amounts of friction or traction, in this case, traction. And also uh, the conditions of the surface is gonna matter. Dry surface is gonna give you a lot more traction than wet surface. When the surface becomes icy, obviously traction goes down. Weight does matter. Heavy objects will experience more friction. All right, so once again, that's an experimental fact. What doesn't matter is that surface area contact doesn't matter. Area does not matter, size doesn't matter. All right. So which means that we will get rid of the first contributing factor. And then the other contributing factors are what cause friction. So the traction is the main cause for friction. And N is a reaction force to any force applied to the surface. So N represents how strongly these surfaces are pressed up against each other stronger they're pressed up against each other, larger the friction again. That's what it means. So traction is the main one and how strongly these surfaces are pressed up against each other. If there's absolutely no traction, there would be no friction, just remember that, all right? And if there's, if these surfaces are not touching, there's no friction, that's an obvious one. But the other obvious one is, look, if it's 100% slippery surface, if there's no traction, there's absolutely no friction. Of how it works, look at this video from ITT Automotive, a company that manufactures ABS systems. Per all right, so now that we did learn something about the nature of friction, why is that the interrupted friction, the friction generated by an ABS and tyler brake system, will generate more friction than a sliding friction or continuous friction? That's the main reason for it. The reason is because there are two types of frictional forces. One of them is called static friction. The other one is called kinetic friction. All right, so static friction happens when the surfaces are Surfaces in contact are at rest relative to each other. And sliding friction happens when one surface is sliding over the other one. Once again, general nature of friction is the same. Depends on the traction number and also depends on how strongly these surfaces are pressed up against each other. That's what it means. Except the amount of traction will differ from a given surface uh, depending upon whether it's a static case or a kinetic case. All right, so static frictional force at or near its maximum value is gonna be larger than the sliding friction because the amount of traction offered by the surface at or near its maximum static frictional force is gonna be larger than while it starts to slip. All right, so the traction numbers are not the same. So at or near the maximum static frictional force, the traction is the greatest. Once you maximize static friction, one surface is gonna to to start to slide over the other one. As a result, what happens is the amount of traction from that surface is gonna diminish, it's gonna go down. So that's what happened. Another thing that you need to kind of wrap your, your head around is the question of, wait a minute, this one is skidding, we get it. So this tire is gonna be experiencing kinetic friction. But this tire is rolling, it's not at rest. Okay, how come this tire, tire is experiencing static friction if that's the case? I mean, this tire is literally rolling. It's not at rest. How does a rolling tire experience static friction? Number one, it's gonna experience this amount of traction from any given surface when this tire is at the verge of skidding. Number two, the only thing you have to worry about is the contact point. All right, so the contact point of this tire is sliding over the other one. This tire, the contact point may change because it's rolling, but the contact point is static relative to the other surface, which means that it's not sliding. The fact that the contact point is not sliding implies that this tire is experiencing static friction. The amount of traction is gonna go up to its maximum value when this tire is at the verge of sliding or skidding. All right, so the traction number, the coefficient of friction, they mean the same thing. Traction number of the coefficient of friction is gonna come maximized. Right at, when the tire is right at the verge of skidding. Here's right, how ABS works. If you need to brake suddenly, an onboard computer pumps the brakes on each wheel. At a so the next question is, 
why is it that the Intel Act brake systems experience larger friction? To 18 times a second. Because Intel Act brake systems pump to brakes like 16, 18, 20, 22 times per second. Faster. Depending than you ever could yourself. That stops the wheels from locking up, allowing you to safely steer around a hazard. So the next question is, so what? I mean, but if there's a test question like that, mistaken, you guys still think, so some of you guys still think that you're just going to feed me back the information. I'll be happy. Nope, that's not how it is. You answer the question, you explain it, you justify it. You just say, oh, because the entire brake system's puppy brakes a number of times per second. That's the reason why the car comes to the station. That's not the reason why the car comes to the station. The reason why the car comes to stop generating because they experience a lot more friction. So the question is, you have to explain how pump the brakes will generate more friction. If that's not explained, I'll give you only two and a half for your effort because you provide an explanation without a justification. I'm not going to give you more than two, two and a half points because there's a huge gap of understanding in your explanation. Pump the brakes will generate more friction, huh? You need to really explain that. You need to really justify that. You have to convince me that you know the answer by explaining and justifying. Here's so how it works. works. If you need, what does it do? It just pumps the brakes for you, right? In this particular case, it's going to be 18 times per second. What does it do? What happens when you put the pumps the brakes? Tire is rolling, you pump the brakes. So what happens? It's going to increase the static friction of force, and when it is increased, it's going to go into a skid. Boom. Notice that the only this portion of the static friction of force is larger than the kinetic friction of force. So the entire brake system is going to pump the brakes within this region. I right, set the brakes, release the brakes. Lock them up, release, lock, release, lock, release. 18 times per second. So more often you pump the brakes within this region, larger the average static frictional force will become. Underline average static frictional force. You can only maximize the average static frictional force, not the maximum static frictional force. They don't mean the same thing. Being able to distinguish between these two concepts is crucial between getting five points and four points at this point. Because some of you guys go, oh, it maximizes the static friction. No, it doesn't maximize the static friction. Not a chance. Pump the brakes will not maximize the static frictional force. The only thing that maximizes the static frictional force is the value of N. Heavier something is the lighter this maximum static frictional force is going to be for a given amount of traction. All right. Pump the brakes will not change the weight of the vehicle. It's not going to change that kind of weight of the vehicle. All right. Pump the brakes, the only thing you can change is the average static frictional force. More often, you can pump within a single second larger the average static frictional force is going to be, sooner the vehicle is going to come to a stop. So this is what you're doing. You're just popping it within this region in order to increase the average static frictional force. That's it. So as a result, the average static frictional force is going to be larger than the kinetic friction. Hence, this car will come to a stop soon. If you don't have an entire brake system, how about pump the brakes? Manually, will that work? That's what they recommend. I highly doubt that that's ever going to work. All right? Because... You just let go and just grab your brakes within a single second. Uh, it's I move. It's probably going to be the same. I almost think that it's probably going to make it worse, but it's probably going to be the same, but or slightly better. It needs to be tested. The best thing to do is if you don't have an entire like brake system, somehow learn to write your brakes near its maximum value. The problem with that is you have to train your reflexes, and the biggest problem with that is weather conditions. Uh, if you train your reflexes for a dry, dry day, the car is going to spin out of control. So you won't be able to control that. All right, so that's just on the side, so it's not that important. Don't be alarmed by the shuddering you'll feel with ABS brakes. That just tells you the system is working. If your car doesn't have ABS, that's when you do pump the brakes, and you should have some steering ability. All right, so that's what they recommend, but I'm not sure how well that works. All right, so as you mean a car traveling at 60 miles per hour, we found a bad We'll come to stop soon, right? No entire lock brake systems does not. They will both skip to your stop. Car and an SUV. All right, so if you're a college physics student, this is the approach that you will take. So some in this one, let me just check to see. College physics or university physics in this case, let me check to see. Well, uh, you're not gonna have much of a choice in this case. I think both of you guys will have to do kind of the same way. All right, uh, 60 miles per hour. The car is, both vehicles are going from 60 to zero. Well, it's getting so they got the coefficient of kinetic friction. So there are two questions. How long would it take for them to come to a stop? What's the distance that they will skid? And how long will it come? Will it take for them to come to a stop? All right. Um, the deal with factors, which means that you will have to show work, which means that you will have to start drawing things out, which means that the, the force diagrams will be required and the identifications of each and every single term is going to be required from now on. 
it, it's been required for a while, but now I'm gonna make sure if it's not there, which means that I you can get a point. I, I, I'd probably give you half a point for trying everything. I'm gonna look at your solution because the only way you can justify a solution is everything that we will be doing is gonna be coming out of these diagrams. That's what it means. We have to show work. It's college, it's university, it doesn't matter. You have to show work. And just because you can visualize it in your head, if it's not there, you don't get points for it. Just, just remember that. I cannot see what's in your head. And then whenever you do something, you have to assume that the person who's doing the grading has no idea what you're doing. All right? So we don't have the secret handshake. Just remember, the only thing that you have is, the only thing agreed upon so far is, the, I understand both of us will have to agree on the fact that I understand these formulas. These are the ones you get to use. All right, that's it. I know what this is. I know what this is. I know what those are. We agreed upon the symbols and we agree upon the formulas from the formula sheet only. Not from any other book, not any sort of notation that you decided to come up with on the spot without explaining why. All right, so these are the notations that we're using. These are the symbols that we're using. And we were using algebra, we we're using trig, and we we're using a little bit of vectors. And that's it. That's the only, those are the only conditions so far. And in problem solving, we are doing everything in three steps. All right, so just follow through the agreement. All right, so look what's gonna happen when I'm solving this problem. I'm gonna explain each and every single step and I'm gonna justify every single formula that I will have. All right, so this is not a math problem. We are solving a physics problem using mathematics and everything will be required to be explained. All right, so I'm listing everything. Next step is force diagrams. There's the center mass, all right? If you're using a book, it's a point. If it's me, I like to use a ball so you can actually see where the center mass is. The forces, so stated otherwise will be applied to center mass. So it's got weight sitting on a surface. There's a reaction force acting on it. The surface force is normal force. Frictional force is pointing to the left because motion is to the right. This thing is moving to the right. This is the distance it's gonna take for it to skid and within this time period, it'll come to a complete stop. All right. So what am I looking for? X is what I'm looking for. I'm trying to figure out the distance it's gonna take for it to come to a stop. Let's get to a stop. All right, so if that's the case, which formula am I gonna use? How you start a problem tells me a lot about whether or not you really get the concept. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's, it's kind of weird. How you start a problem tells me whether or not you have any understanding or inkling of how to actually approach a problem from a really good understanding perspective. All right, there's a huge difference between a problem that a person does because the person has such a great understanding of what's going on versus a person who decided to come up with a solution based upon some book that this person is looking at or some solution manual that this person is looking at, or they just copy it from someone else. Okay, because the understanding, the coherency is completely missing a lot of the time. Case in point, X is what I'm looking for. If I know that I'm looking for X, ideally I need to find a formula that has an X in it. I look at my toolbox and these are the only formulas available to me out of my toolbox. I pick and chose the ones that I think I can use from my toolbox. I pick a formula for force because there's acceleration here. This thing is gonna slow down. And force is what causes acceleration. This is an F force formula. And then the acceleration could be a variable acceleration if that's the case. I got the average acceleration because if there's jerk, that's the only thing I can use. Or if the acceleration is uniform, I got three more formulas on the side. All right, I just get my formulas ready. I just go into the toolbox. As soon as I look at the problem, I say, oh, I see what's going on here. All right, I'm not gonna be interested in any other formulas because this is what's available in my toolbox. All right, so those are the formulas. In addition to that, obviously you need to have the frictional force formulas, blah, 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 different things. All right, so these are the fundamental formulas that I have. The next thing is X is what I'm interested in. This formula's got X in it, so it's the last one. So now I have to make a decision, which formula do I wanna start with? T is not given, all right? So which means that this is the only formula that I can use. Immediately I go, okay, so that's the one I'm gonna use. All right, so isolate X and then check to see what else we need to do. All right, so good, mathematically I'm done with this. And then I'll check to see if I got the numbers for. All right, so initial speed is given, that's gonna be 60 miles per hour. X is what I'm looking for, A is not given. So what did I do? Oh, well, that's the reason why you got the toolbox. So A requires, what causes A in the first place? Acceleration is caused by a force. If you make that connection in your head, then you're not looking for, oh, I wonder if I could use A from this formula or A from that formula, A from that formula. There's no such thing. All right, you can't just eyeball symbols and check to see how you're gonna do a substitution. That's not how it works under these circumstances. It requires a really deep understanding, clear understanding of what's what. This acceleration that you're looking at, this one, has to be caused by a force. So which means that now you have to use the net force formula. You're thinking, oh, so I can use this, F equals MA, and isolate A from it, and back substitution. 
Not quite. Let me explain one more time. This is a net force formula. All right, it's a generic net force formula, which means that you need to identify what this net force is. So, so which means that you have to reinterpret this formula. So, A is going to be caused by a net force along the x direction. Now, you need to figure out what that net force is. There's only one single force acting along the x direction. That happens to be the frictional force. All right, notice that this net force, F is the net force that you're looking at. I have to interpret it for motion along the x direction. And I had to identify the actual net force. I have to sum up all the forces along the x direction. Well, lucky there's only one pointing it to the left. All right, so the net force becomes the negative of the frictional force. And then from here, you can solve for A. <laughs> and from here, you can do it by substitution. Perfect. And then you got a negative and negative, so that's going to give you a positive. And denominator of a denominator is a numerator, so I'll pull that up. So that's just math, which I assume that you guys can handle it because it's a prerequisite. And this is just simple symbolic argument, so there's nothing fancy here. All right, now I stop again. I'll check to see if I got my numbers. All right. Uh, we got a mass for the current SUV, so that's good. We know the initial speed. We don't quite know the frictional force, right? But what is it that we know? We know the coefficient of friction. So, which means that we need to come up with an expression for the frictional force, which happens to be this. You could do a back substitution here. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to take it one step further. We got mu sub k, but we don't know what n is. But we know where you get from your n from. Where do you get it from? It's the surface force, guys. It's a reaction force, and air force applied to the surface. In this case, the surface force, normal force, is coming about because of the weight of the vehicle. All right, so now let's figure out N in terms of what's given. So sum up all the forces along the y direction this time. N is up, W is down. And the mass is not accelerating up or down, so the acceleration is zero, which means that N is the same as W. W is the same as NG. And now we do a back substitution. Now we got an expression for the frictional force that you can substitute back. And I'll say you notice that the mass doesn't matter, all right? So it's, it's, a, it's a SUV or a car, it makes no difference. It's not gonna matter. So the only thing that's gonna matter is, as this all happens, is the quality of the tires. Higher the quality of the tires, the sooner it's gonna come to the stop. For, for given initial speed, both vehicles are moving at 60 miles per hour. SUV, car, motorcycle, trailer truck, makes no difference, makes absolutely no difference. Everything will come to a stop while skating the same distance. All right, so that's what it is. And that's the reason why in the beginning of the presentation, I said, if you become a politician, if you override an engineer, guys, I will come after you with a baseball bat. Do something that's stupid because you get a law degree, I can hurt you. All right, your common sense is no substitute for education. Just leave it up to the expert. All right, if somebody did the competitions, if they decided to have a runway, which is about this long, that's how much of a runway they need. Okay, that's it. For lending, their special speed is required. More or less, is as long as you're within that speed limit, you will have a plenty of runway to come to a stop, no more than that. All right? It has nothing to do with the weight or the mass of the vehicle. All right, so now that I talked about it, I'm going to give you a hint, and then it doesn't matter how many times I explain it, it makes no difference. People, when you're listening, you're listening, people get distracted, blah, blah, blah. And, and then eventually you get better at it. Most of you guys, number one, this requires practice, 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 practice solving these problems symbolically, practice it, all right? How do you practice something like that? Number one, redo it on your own. Number two, do part B on your own. I'm not giving you part B, all right? Do part B on your own. If you can do this stuff on your own, symbolically, if you understand how it is done, if you practice it and practice it and practice it, you should be able to solve any problem that I give you. Of course, I'm gonna give you a vari variation of it. And you guys are thinking, oh, the numbers will be different. No, guys, I can just give you I don't know, I can give you the distance as for the initial speed, all right? I can give you a fraction of the maximum static frictional force. I can give you, there's like three, four different ways I, I can I can word it so that you have, you're, you're gonna be forced to solve it in the same fashion, but the algebra is gonna be different, all right? So practice it, you don't have it. This is what I want you guys to focus on, just practice it and practice it and practice it. And the, another thing that I'm just gonna mention, and this is the sort of mistake that I see is Net force is what I'm looking for. This is a generic net force formula. So, which means that this needs to be interpreted on the x and the y direction. And the biggest thing that really upsets a lot of people, and hopefully upsets you enough when you lose points that you don't repeat it, is show all the work. All right, once you're on a math track, it's math at this point. Just follow it. Just think about the physics and then stay within the limits of mathematics. Don't make anything up. Net force means some of all the forces. 
That's exactly what that means. Only extra. There's only one force. There's no second force. There's no third force here. Don't put down extra symbols. There, there's not. And then you guys move on to the next step, which is you go into the frictional force formula. Let's go down there. This N, you assume this N to be W. I didn't, I made no assumptions, guys. I made no assumptions. If you make that assumption, you lose points. You cannot, you cannot put the, you cannot make an assumption without justifying it. N is W only if the net force on the y direction is zero. And N is W only if it's a flat surface. If it's an angle surface, N is not going to be W. It's going to be a fraction of W. All right? Don't make those kind of assumptions without justifying it. And when I say justify it, I don't mean I'll go blah, blah, blah. I'm not looking for poetry. I'm looking for mathematics. All right? Here is the proof that N is W. I did the work. I didn't make the assumption that N is W. You can't make that assumption. N is just the reaction force, the force supply to your surface. And that force depends on the angle. All right? Any force applied to your surface does not mean that it's just weight. It could be a push against the surface. And it, it depends on the angle. All right? And it's always going to be 90 degrees to the surface, but the force applied to the surface can be, could be coming at an angle. So it, the angle is going to matter. So don't make those kind of weird assumptions. And they all work is shown, obviously, and this is how it is done. All right, so those of you guys who are engineering majors will benefit from this because we'll have to take engineering statics and dynamics at some point. I think our school is going to offer that at some point. They're not offering it as yet. Uh, so that was uh, part of the agreement before I decided to take this job that our school was going, is going to start offering engineering classes because we need to make this program competitive. Okay, ideally, I want you guys to be able to take all your physics courses at the school and all your engineering courses at the school and then transfer out as a third year, year student, as a junior in an engineering program somewhere else. All right, so this is for university physics students. All right, so plenty of time to practice for college physics as well as the university physics students at this point, because it's algebra. Algebra is required for both of them. The only difference is going to be the quality of the test question. All right, quality of the test question is going to be different. So in either case, you get like 140 feet. So if you get into, I mean, if you get into an accident at 60 miles per hour, you lock up the brakes. And like in the scenario that I gave you in class, there's a kid run, runs in front of you, lock up the brakes. So this kid marks well, all the way up to the kid, over the kid, about 140 feet. When the police shows up, obviously you're not gonna be honest and say, hey, gee, I was going at 60 miles per hour, so shoot me, all right? No, you will say, hey, officer, I was going at 30 miles per hour, it's a 30 miles per hour zone. The kid came out of nowhere, I did the best, look, the skid marks. And then the guy's gonna measure the skid marks, it's 140 feet. So at that point, he knows that you were screwed. All right, you weren't going at 30, you were going double this, double that speed. All right, so now that we figured this out mathematically, now let's talk about the conceptual explanation. So which one comes to the stop zone? Is it the car or is it the SUV? Neither. All right, neither. Mass doesn't matter. Why not? The, what matters is the amount of friction. So the frictional force is what brings it to a stop, what slows down the car, right? And frictional force is directly proportional to the weight or the mass of the vehicle. All right, so the car, which is twice as heavy, is going to experience two times more, twice, as, twice more friction, all right? The car, which is five times heavier, is going to experience a frictional force five times larger. And as a result, the weight doesn't matter, right? The frictional force is proportional to the weight. It's proportional to the mass. As a result, the mass doesn't matter. So the only thing that matters is the quality of the time. So which one, if any, will come to a stop sooner, they will come to a stop at the same time. Car versus a train, 60 miles per hour. Which one will come to a stop sooner if they lock up their brakes at the same time? If the mass doesn't matter, you're thinking, oh, so they should both come to a stop at the same time. You're missing the point. It's no. All right. Friction is the reason why both vehicles will come to stop sooner, right? But the amount of friction depends on the surfaces, right? The different surfaces will offer different amounts of friction. Rubber on concrete on a dry surface, while the tires are skidding is going to 0.85. Steel on steel for the train is going to offer much less friction, right? It's 0.85. This is 0.48. So the car will come to stop sooner. There's no question about it. But if it car takes 140 feet, train is not going to take mile and a half. That's complete nonsense. And if it's a fully loaded freight train, mass doesn't matter. That's complete nonsense. All right. So if it takes 140 feet for a car to come to the stop, it's going to take almost 100 feet more for a train to come to the stop. 100 tons and 10 so That's the difference. Miles an hour might take um, 60 miles an hour. Might take the loaded freight going 60 miles an hour. Might take a mile and a half to come to a halt after the brakes are applied. Nonsense. All right. So all right, so that's pretty much it. So let's go over what it is that I want you guys to focus on. All right, so problem number three, focus on problem number three. That's the one that we focus on. Repeat the same question and do part A. I did part B. 
and then apply to problem number four. And that's it. All right. And the problem that you will see on the test is going to be similar to what we just covered. All right. So in terms of concepts, let's just go over the questions. External force, whenever we walk, is going to originate from friction, surface friction. And the reason why we're able to walk is because we, we utilize the Newton's third law. We apply a force on the ground in the opposite direction of our motion. Through friction, we apply a force in the backward direction. And through friction, the ground is going to apply the same force back on us in the forward direction. So the reaction force from the ground will become the external force acting on our bodies. All right, so the car with the enthalpic brake system will come to a stop sooner because it generates more friction. It's a short answer for this one. Commonsensical contributing factors for friction is the size of the surface area contact, the amount of traction that you get from different surfaces, and obviously how tightly the surfaces are pressed up against each other, the weight in this case. Except the surface area contact is no contribution whatsoever to friction. Surface area contact does not contribute. All right, so the only contributing factors are the coefficient of friction, that's the amount of traction that you can get from a surface, and how tightly the surfaces are pressed up against each other, the normal force or the apparent force. There are two kinds of friction. One is called static friction. In engineering, we call it this dry friction. The second one is called kinetic friction. It's sliding friction. They mean the same thing. All right, so static frictional force here, its maximum value is going to be larger than the kinetic friction force. That's it. The reason is because the amount of traction you get from a surface at or near the verge of skidding is going to be larger than the skidding or sliding friction. All right, so the static or kinetic frictional force, which one is larger? All right, so in regions near its maximum value, the static frictional force is going to be larger than the kinetic frictional force because at the verge of skidding, there's going to be a lot more traction between the surfaces. So the traction is the coefficient of friction. Entelic rates will lock up 18 times per second in order to increase the average static frictional force. All right, so you, you pop the brakes within the region of the static friction, which is larger than the kinetic friction force. So within that region, the brakes usually are pumped. And, in order to, and then the whole idea is more after you pump the brakes within a second, the larger the average static friction force is going to become. And then the sooner the car will come to a stop relative to the cars without the entelic brake systems. If you don't have any entelic brake systems, they recommend that you pump the brakes because they want you to increase the average static frictional force and hopefully make it larger than the kinetic friction force. Hopefully. I don't really know how well this works. I'm not entirely convinced that this works at all. Right, because how many times a second can you pump the brakes? I, I, once, what good is that going to do? I, I don't know. All right, so the, maybe just pump the brakes as soon as it goes into the scale, let it go and grab it again. It may make a difference. I'm not sure how much of a difference it's going to make. You may be able to control the car better, but I'm not sure if it's going to come to a stop that much sooner. That's, I wonder if there are any tests done on it that I can see, because I'm not entirely convinced right now that that's going to make that much of a difference. It's just too common sense to them.